In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it's going to be a little different. It's going to be an interactive episode. In this episode, I want you, the listener, to help me answer these questions. Let me know, am I tripping, am I bugging? Because I have some questions about the rookies and their roles and their fits based off one game. I know it's early. I know it's way early, but I still have some questions. Stay tuned to find out the five burning questions I have after the rookies made their debut in the 2023-24 NBA season. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. I'm a little under the weather. If you've noticed, I haven't been putting out a lot of content lately. It's not load management. I was out of the country and then traveling back. For some reason now, I'm starting to catch colds. And and so I actually had to spend the night at the airport in Miami coming from Madrid. But that's a whole different story. So no load management. I'm a little under the weather, but I will make it up with episodes over the next few days. And this episode is brought to you by a new sponsor called Dave. All you have to do is download Dave today at dave.com. Check this out. Download dave.com slash locked on NBA and you could get up to $500 in five minutes or less. No credit check, no late fees. That is dave.com slash locked on NBA. Now this episode, I want you, the listener, I want you to to help me with these questions. So if you are watching on YouTube, you can respond or reply on the YouTube page. And if you're following on the podcast, you can send me a message at Barlow, B-A-R-L-O-W-E-5-0-0 on Twitter. Because I have some questions. I have some questions and I know, again, it is super early. A lot can change. A lot can happen between now and the end of the season. A lot can happen in the NBA between now and January 1st. But just based off of the the games that were played this week, I got some questions. And the first question I have is related to Victor Wimayama, the top pick, who had a a good game. I'll be honest. I saw the first half of the game. I caught myself closing my eyes for a little bit at halftime. And when I woke up, I saw he had 15 points. And then when I woke up again, the TV was like off like the... The, the screen had turned different colors because everything was off because I guess, you know, when your TV goes idle. I fell asleep. I'm still getting adjusted to the time difference after spending two weeks in Europe. So I had to go back and rewatch the game. And I did see Victor had his, his first NBA bucket was a three and so on. But the question I have, and I'm thinking out loud here, but I want you to answer this question for me is, How do you think the Jeremy Sohan point guard experiment is going to impact Victor Wimbayama? Do you think it's going to have a good impact or negative impact? And and, and here's my question behind it. So my thought process is if you have like a generational talent like Victor Wimbayama, the first thing you want to do is pair him with a traditional point guard that can get him easy looks, that knows how to find him on the road, that just understands how to manage a team. Not saying that Sohan doesn't know how to do that, but in my opinion, I just think it's a little, I guess risky is probably not the correct choice of words because I think they're going to be fine. But I just thought like, it was a no-brainer to pair him with a traditional point guard that can get him the easy buckets that's going to find him when he's rim running and he has a, a mismatch. And so with the Jeremy Sohan point guard experience, that's something I did not see coming, coming into the season. So my question is, do you think that can have a positive or negative impact on him? I'm guessing here. I'm just totally guessing. And maybe Greg Popovich... And, uh, let me say this before I go on. You can't question Greg Popovich. Well, I mean, I guess you can, but you can't question his resume and what he's done for the NBA and what he's accomplished. So I guess you give him the benefit of the doubt as opposed to some other coaches. Because I'll be honest, most coaches wouldn't have the guts to do this if they had Victor Wimbayama. But the question is, do you think that Pop is making a mistake by 
giving Sohan the, the keys to the offense in the starting unit. Now, unless he's doing what Jason Kidd did a few years back with Giannis, when he let Giannis play with the ball in his hands a lot, even though he wasn't going to be his primary position. But I felt like Kidd was allowing Giannis to make mistakes as the ball handler and develop, knowing that down the line he becomes a, a, a better secondary ball handler or a better playmaker based off of his experience running the offense when the team didn't have expectations. So maybe that is Pop's theory there. But the concern I have with Sohan, even though he played well, he had five assists, but I think his lack of shooting is going to impact Victor in the spacing. I mean, just in my opinion, if you run like this Sohan, Wimbayama pick and roll, every team is going to go under. They're going to follow Victor. And Sohan only shot 24% from three or 2.4 attempts last year. Not a great free throw shooter, even though he got better once he switched to one hand. But I wonder if you have a non-shooter at the point guard, how much is that going to impact your star player or the guy that you're building around as far as getting him open looks? Am I tripping? Am, am I bugging out here? Share with me your thoughts on the Jeremy Sohan point guard experience. Now, I know Trey Jones is going to play a lot of minutes and he's going to play a lot with Victor. So that's not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a situation where Victor is going to be on the floor at all times with a non-traditional point guard. But I just wonder how much is it going to impact Victor in as far as the, the Spurs spacing? Because, again, you have a point guard that is a somewhat of a reluctant shooter, but is not the type of shooter that defenses are going to respect out of pick and roll. So let me know your thoughts there. Now, another question I have is about the Charlotte Hornets. Can the Charlotte Hornets, yes, the Charlotte Hornets, with all of their mess and all the just the the absolute crap that they have going on in their organization. Can the Charlotte Hornets be a surprise team in the East this year? And if so, what type of role will Brandon Miller have in elevating the Hornets to possibly a play-in team? Now, if you remember, just two years ago, the Charlotte Hornets were 43 and 39. They made the play-in tournament. Then, if I remember correctly, they just absolutely just put up a dud in that tournament. And if you look at the roster, it is pretty much the same team. I mean, a few guys are gone here, but LaMelo's back, Rogier, Hayward, P.J. Washington. you got Mark Williams, who I think is going to make a, a huge impact. Mark Williams is better than, I think Plumlee was their starting center that year. you got to imagine P.J. Washington is better than he was two years ago. LaMelo should be better. So with that being said, I think the Charlotte Hornets could make some noise, believe it or not. I mean, when you think about the Charlotte Hornets, especially over the last year, you just think of just all the negativity surrounding that franchise. And so I know it was just one game against the Atlanta Hawks, but I wonder, can they be a surprise team? Now, when I'm looking at the, the East, and these are my locks for the playoffs, Boston Celtics, Milwaukee Bucks, Miami Heat, New York Knicks, that's four. You got the Philadelphia 76ers, Cleveland Cavaliers, that's six. Then I would say the Hawks at seven. And then after that, I mean, you got the Pacers, the Bulls, the Magic, the Raptors, the Nets. I think they're all in this, this mix where they're only going to be a few games that are going to separate maybe eight through, I don't know, 11. And, and, and of course, you know, things could change. Like I said, there could be injuries and so on. But I think Charlotte could be in that mix. All right, when we return, I'll, I'll go a little bit more in depth why I think Charlotte could be in that mix and how Brandon Miller could play a key role in Charlotte making a return to the playoffs. But before I get into that, I want to talk to you about our new sponsor, Days, because at one time or another, and I think we've all been through it, We've needed a little financial help, and I can definitely relate. I am independent. I've been on this journey to do what I love. I took the hard route. I quit my corporate job to focus on 
pursuing a career in sports. I've been through it, I've been, I've been broke, broke. But I didn't have a Dave. And Dave is great because Dave offers financial help. Dave can get you cash when you need it in hand between paychecks and, and Dave can also help you build your credit by settling extra cash advances on time. Dave would have been so useful for me back in the day. I mean, I can tell you all about my struggles and my journey to pursue a career in sports. And if I would have had Dave, things would have been a little bit more simpler because Dave is a banking app that is leveling the financial playing field. When you download Dave, you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less. There's no credit check, there's no late fees, and it is part of Dave's extra cash account. Advance the money you will need with no interest, and then settle for later. Extra cash gives you money to buy groceries, fill your tank, maybe help with an unexpected bill. I know we've all been hit with the check engine light or or you know you, you have a blowout on the road and you need some extra cash for the unexpected and this where dave can come and help because you can even build credit with dave that's something that's that's big you know a lot of times when you go through these payday advances it messes your credit up with dave you can build credit millions of people have already downloaded the dave app to make their finances easier so if you are in a pinch and you need some extra cash you can get the help you need by downloading Dave. So download Dave today at dave.com slash locked on NBA. That is dave.com slash locked on NBA. And you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less. No credit check, no late fees. Download the Dave app now. Go to dave.com slash locked on NBA. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees do apply, and the banking service are provided by Evolve, which is a member of the FDIC. Again, Dave.com. Now, if you've been paying attention, there is a lot, a lot of stuff going on around the world, a lot of conflict, just whether it's weather related, just the stuff going on all over, and, and when there's just a lot of stuff and, 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 and craziness going on in the world. One of the impacts is that it can lead to supply chain shortages for medications or the inability for people to get medication in a timely manner. And that's why there's the Jace case. The Jace case is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacteria infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life-saving medications based on your unique needs. And Jace Medical offers customized Jace cases. They, they can be customized for you or your family's needs. So go to jacemedical.com, enter the code locked on at checkout and you can receive a $20 discount. That is Jace Medical. Use the promo code locked on at J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, when we left off, I was talking about Brandon Miller, who was the number two pick in the 2023 NBA draft. There are still people to this day that believe that Brandon Miller should not have went ahead of Scoot Henderson. And I thought Brandon Miller had a better debut game than Scoot Henderson. Again, I know it's just one game. But seeing the way Miller played and seeing how Charlotte played, it just makes me believe that they have a chance this year. I mean, everybody's writing them off. Everybody's basically talking about all the nonsense going on. But I think Charlotte has a chance to be a surprise team in the East. And I believe that Brandon Miller can have a key role as a, I don't know if he's going to start because they're probably going to start Gordon Hayward. But I could see Brandon Miller averaging 15 points a game, shooting a three at a high clip. And he has the benefit of playing with LaMelo Ball, who's going to give him open looks. He has a, LaMelo has a role man in Mark Williams, which the threat of the role man is going to create open looks for Brandon Miller. And I also think that Brandon is going to showcase what I've been saying for about a year now, that he did not get a chance to show at Alabama, is that he has game in the mid post. He can shoot pull-up jumpers. So I think Brandon Miller is going to have a really good rookie year. So my question for you is, is Charlotte a team that could possibly be in the play-in game or more? And do you think that Brandon Miller, because of Charlotte, at least, well, you know, it depends on how you feel. Charlotte could have a better team than Portland. Do you think that there is a world that we live in that Brandon Miller 
could have a better rookie season than Scoot Henderson. Because we know Scoot is going to have the ball in his hands. I mean, he's like the quarterback of the team. So he's going to have the ball in his hands more. He's not going to have to rely on anyone getting him touches. But do you think Brandon Miller can have a better rookie year than Scoot Henderson? Because possibly Brandon Miller is playing a significant role on a better team. So if you have, if you have the answer to that question, you can send me a message on Twitter or you can reply on the YouTube channel. All right. Number three. Asor Thompson. Now, if you remember on draft day, I was not a fan of Thompson's fit in Detroit. And it's not a knock on Thompson by any means. I'm just not a fan of the Detroit Pistons surrounding Cade Cunningham with non-shooters. The biggest knock on Asor Thompson. The most glaring weakness in his game was the shooting. So I've always thought, well, not always, but since the draft, I thought that's just a, such a bad fit. Now, let me know if you think I'm tripping or not, because I think Cade is the guy, and I think he's the one that you need to build around. And I'm not saying that they made a mistake by drafting Thompson. I just am not a fan of the fit. Now, on opening night, Cade went off. He had 30 points, 9 assists, and a 1-point loss to Miami. Detroit competed, and Thompson finished just 1 of 7 from the floor, but he chipped in 3 assists and 5 blocks. If I'm not mistaken, that's like a record. He is ready to compete on the defensive end. I think he's going to be a really, really good NBA player. In a perfect world, I would have loved to see him go to a situation where he would be like the primary ball handler. I, I really believe that. Now, I know there aren't a lot of those situations available, but I would love to see him as the primary ball handler because I think he's a phenomenal passer with his athleticism. And in Detroit, I mean, they have a lot of guys that need the ball. I just, I'm just not a fan of in the half court, Cade having the ball and who's ever guarding Thompson is going to be helping. And so let me know if you think I'm crazy. Do you think that, I mean, we're not just talking about this year, down the line. And let's say Thompson progresses as a shooter at a gradual pace. Do you think that is still a good fit for K Cunningham as far as spacing? I'm just thinking like short term and long term. I just am not a big fan of the fit. I mean, the Pistons starting lineup, they started K. Cunningham, Killian Hayes, Sword Thompson, Isaiah Stewart, and Jalen Duran. If I'm an opposing coach, boxes and elbows. Now, Detroit, I think they shot like 11 or 34 from three that game, which is, I mean, it's not great. It's probably below average, but it's not absolutely terrible. And they did only lose by one to a Miami team that is expected to possibly make a deep playoff run. I mean, you always got to, you know, consider Miami a threat to, to, to go deep in the playoffs. So I thought if you're a Pistons fan, you were pleased with the way they play. But just long term, or, or I'll just say that, just for this season, and I know Boyan Bogdanovich is not in the lineup. And I know once he's back healthy, he is going to provide the spacing. But do you think this... This trio, and maybe it's not even trio, because, I mean, if Killian Hayes is starting, you got to consider Jaden Ivey in there. So do you think the Jaden Ivey, Kay Cunningham, Killian Hayes, or Sword Thompson, do you think those four, as their guard rotation, do you think they complement each other? Do you think that group can work? Let me know. Again, Barlow500 on Twitter, or you can respond to the comments on YouTube. All right. Number four. What in the world was Jason Kidd thinking by not starting Derek Lively on opening night? Now, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. I was in Europe, and you know, the time difference, the game started like one o'clock in the morning, so I was dozing off. But if I'm not mistaken, I felt like Derek Lively started all the Mavs preseason games. And he had his best preseason game, in my opinion, against the Pistons in the last playoff game. I mean, dude was dunking backwards. I felt like the chemistry he had with Kyrie was great. And to my surprise, on opening night, he doesn't start. Now, I don't know 
if Kid was trying to lower the expectations, I have no idea. But Derek Lively needs to be the Mavericks starting center. And again, I'm biased. I said Derek Lively to the Mavs as soon as the Mavericks got the 10th pick. I thought he was the perfect fit for Dallas. I thought he would be in the ideal situation for him to thrive. I was not concerned about his lack of production on the offensive end at Duke. Not concerned at all. I thought Dallas should have taken him at number 10. And I guess Dallas won by trading back and still getting the guy who I thought was their perfect fit and shedding some salary at that. But I don't understand why Kidd didn't start Derek Lively. There's a game tonight against the Brooklyn Nets and Lively should be the starting center tonight. And Lively proved why he should be the starting center. In 30 minutes off the bench, he finished with 16 points, 10 rebounds, shooting seven of eight from the floor, and he was a team high plus 20 in the box score plus minus. According to the record books, he became only the second player in NBA history to score 15 points plus, grab 10 plus rebounds, and shoot above 85% from the floor in a debut game. Jason Kidd, do not overthink it. Start Derek Lively. He gives the Mavs a vertical lob threat. More importantly, a live body. Not, he didn't really block a lot of shots at the rim, but he gives the Mavs something that they haven't had since Tyson Chandler. A long, long arm rim protector that plays with a motor, that can finish plays above the rims, that gets extra possessions with tap outs. Derek Lively should be the Mavs starting center. Now, my question to you, the audience, is, did you think that Derek Lively was going to have this type of impact for Dallas? Like, you know, a lot of people felt like, oh, man, he wasn't productive at Duke. A lot of people thought you do not select a big man this high in the draft. Again, I know it's one game, and I know somebody could say, hey, man, you're overreacting. But this, I have two questions. Do you think that Derek Lively can be a double-double threat for the Dallas Mavericks this year as a rookie? And do you think that the success or the potential success of Lively will benefit centers in future drafts? Because I feel like teams passed up on Walker Kessler last year. Mark Williams, I think, is, is going to be a really good piece for the Hornets' long-term plans. I think Derek Lively is going to be good. So do you think teams going forward are going to say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with selecting a rim runner, vertical lobster that can anchor the defense high in the draft? Because there's been a lot of chatter over the last two years. Oh, you don't need to draft a center high. Don't draft them in the lottery. You can get them later on. They're like running backs. But do you think that if a guy is – you know, a rim protector, vertical lob threat can anchor your defense. Do you think those guys are worth lottery picks going forward? Let me know. All right, when we return, I have probably, this may be a little bit controversial, but we're going to talk about fit in rookies. And I mean, I mean, we can use Derek Lively as an example. Lively was the perfect fit, and he was able to play 30 minutes per game because he was in the right fit. Do you think some rookies are in bad situations early where they are going to struggle to earn minutes down the season? And, I, and I'll give you some examples when we return. But let's talk about prize picks. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. All you have to do is pick two to six players and you basically you just pick whether or not they will beat the projections. You're not playing against anybody else. And you can win up to 25 times your money. Again, select two players or more, and it is just you versus the numbers. And let's just use football, for example. Does Saquon Barkley run for more than 60 yards and Patrick Mahomes throws for more than two passing touchdowns? Do you think that Justin Jefferson goes for less than 100 yards and Lamar Jackson throws for more than one touchdown? I mean, there's so many options in prize picks that you can make money. Again, prize picks is daily fantasy made easy if you want to get in. And again, you can win up to 25 times your money. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. 
and use the promo code Locked On NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Again, they'll match up to one hundred dollars. Get PrizePicks.com slash Locked On NBA and use the promo code Locked On NBA, and they'll match up to one hundred dollars. All right, last segment, and this is again, I may be jumping the gun here. And it can be seen as somewhat controversial. So I watch a lot of college basketball, like a lot of college basketball. And then I watch a lot of NBA basketball. And throughout the season, every year, I look at the projected lottery picks, obviously, because I talk about them all the time. And then I go watch an NBA game. And then I'm thinking, like, how many of these guys could come in and make an impact on a team right now and I always tell myself there's only a few guys that can come in and you can plug in and play them on an NBA team and they could crack the rotation and make an impact and of course you know sometimes teams have to clear out space so their rookies can get minutes and I felt like opening night it was pretty evident that there are some guys that were selected in the lottery that are going to struggle to find minutes this year on their team unless some moves are made, injuries, or somebody's playing absolutely horrible. Check this out. Six of the 14 lottery picks play less than 10 minutes on opening night. Six of the 14 lottery picks, not first round picks, lottery picks play less than 10 minutes on opening night. Now, we know injuries happen and trades happen, but for the sake of conversation, how will these rookies that I'm going to name, how are they going to find consistent minutes down the line? And just to show the importance of fit, like I mentioned with Derek Lively, only two rookies played more than 30 minutes per game, which I wasn't expecting a bunch of rookies to play 30 minutes per game, but only two rookies played more than 30 minutes per game. Derek Lively, who was the 12th pick, and Scoot Henderson, who was the third pick. Now, Victor would have likely played that if he wasn't in foul trouble. Just two rookies. But again, six rookies play less than 10 minutes per game. So basically right now, we got six of the top 14 lottery picks are like back-end rotation guys. And I'm wondering, unless something changes, where are they going to find minutes? First, we'll go with Anthony Black, the sixth pick. In the 2023 NBA draft, played four minutes and 48 seconds, and that was late in the game because the Orlando Magic blew out the Houston Rockets. Cole Anthony played well. I think he was their leading scorer. Jalen Suggs started along with Markel Fultz. Where is Anthony Black going to find minutes? I think it's going to be a struggle. Jairus Walker only played five minutes and 41 seconds. That was surprising to me. I thought he played a little bit more. I thought he had a strong preseason, especially the game against Memphis. I'm, I mean, I know that he's going to be behind Obi Toppin, but I was shocked to see him only play five minutes and 41 seconds. So, that, you know, like, let me know, in your opinion, where is he going to find consistent minutes? Again, I know it's only one game and it could all change, you know, over the next day or two. But I was shocked to see him only play five minutes and 41 seconds. Taylor Hendricks was the ninth pick in the 2023 NBA draft. Didn't play in summer league. Didn't play a lot in the preseason. Only played two minutes and 25 seconds. Now, what's very interesting about that is Taylor Hendricks was the guy that everyone seemed to have wanted the Dallas Mavericks to take at number 10 if he were available. It was like he's the perfect fit, yada, yada, yada. Goes to Utah at number nine. Utah ends up making a trade for John Collins. And now he is on the, I mean, the outside, outside looking in. Fit is important. Like, I know a lot of people want to go higher in the draft. And I've heard, like, different agents try to preach to their players, hey, do not worry about where you go. Fit is the most important thing. And I, I just heard Rich Paul talk about that also. So you look at Taylor Hendricks. you kind of trying to figure out like hey where am I going to play am I going to spend my rookie year playing for the Salt Lake City Stars because I don't see a clear path for playing time but you know and maybe it can work for him because it could be a developmental year Jed Howard 
The 11th pick of the Orlando Magic only played four minutes and 48 seconds in a blowout win against the Houston Rockets. Makes me wonder, if they don't blow out Houston, does Jet and Anthony Black even get in the game? Your two lottery picks, do they even get in the game? And I thought Orlando was a team that had a lot of redundant skill sets and a lot of overlapping pieces, and I thought it would have been tough for a rookie to come in there and, and, and play anyway. But two lottery picks that aren't getting in major minutes or in your rotation, it's got to be tough. And then you got Grady Dick, who was the 13th pick. He played two minutes and seven seconds for Toronto. And then Jordan Hawkins played nine minutes and 13 seconds. And I think Jordan Hawkins benefited because of injuries. Because Trey Murphy's hurt, Najee Marshall's hurt. Maybe he would have been ahead of Marshall. I don't know. But again, six of the top 14 picks in the 2023 draft played less than 10 minutes on opening night. So it goes back to my theory of, well, I guess I won't call it a theory, but it just goes back to my thought process of when I'm watching film on, in, in live games during the college season, it's very rare that I see a guy that is projected to go high that I can say, you know what, you can plug him on this non-playoff team and he is going to be in their top seven or eight rotation. And when I look at it from that lens, it kind of makes the entire evaluation prospect or process a little bit more difficult. I mean, of course, there's like no-brainers. Like, you know, okay, Scoot is going to play early. You know, Victor is going to play early. You know, Brandon Miller is going to play early. So now when I look at the 2024 NBA draft, which is not considered a strong class at all, and I'm looking, and of course, again, a lot can change, but when I'm looking at that class, and I think all of these guys that I mentioned, Anthony Black, Jairus Walker, Taylor Hendricks, Jet Howard, Grady Dick, Jordan Hawkins, if they stayed in school, they would probably be mentioned as the potential number one or at least top five picks in the 2024 class because it's not considered strong. How many guys in 2024 class right now, again, I'm thinking way ahead, do you feel like can come in and contribute and help a non-playoff team or a team that you don't think is going to make the playoffs? Can come in and contribute and help right away and crack their top rotation? Let me know. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow. Thank you so much for making the Locked On NBA Big Bro podcast your first listen of the day. I hope you like this interactive episode. I want to hear all your questions. I want to, I mean, I want to hear your answers to my questions. Again, Barlow500 on Twitter. And if you are watching on YouTube, just comment under the comments. Also, share, subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff. That is the way to help us grow the YouTube channel. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, and I am out.